Hey guys, in this video, I'd like to discuss about the crow questions for the third course students. Well, these are the most important, one of the important previously repeated questions. So I'd like to solve as many as questions for you people. So let's start from the first question here. This is Dr. Mati Prasanna, which uh, I'm explaining you about the questions right now. So let's start. Guys, a 30-year-old patient complained about having abdominal pain and diarrhea for 5 days. Body temperature rose up to 37.5 de degrees Celsius along with chills the day before he had been in a forest. So, this is a point where we need to look and drunk from an open water reservoir. So, he had a water from the open reservoir. Open reservoirs are the source for parasites and amoeba infection. Parasites and amoeba infections. So this is the first question explanation which I am talking here. Okay. Now laborate, uh, reservoir. laboratory analysis enabled to make the following diagnosis amoebic dysentery. So on laboratory investigation they found that the person was having what? Amoebic dysentery. When the person is having amoebic dysentery, what is the drug of choice for the treatment? Okay. Now among all the given drugs, let's look, the answer is metronidazole, metronidazole, furazolidium, levomycetin, phthalazole and Imitin hydrochloride. Okay. Among given all the options, the drug of choice for the treatment of the amoebic dysentery will be metronidazole. So you need to remember one thing is that all amoebic infection, the drug of choice will be drug of choice will be metronidazole. Okay. Metronidazole. Now, what this metronidazole does, the metronidazole's mechanism of action is a very simple thing. What happens, it will go react with the, it, it will go enters inside the amoeba and it will form some cytotoxic compounds. It will form some cytotoxic compounds. So, cytotoxic compound is nothing but what? Cytotoxic compound is nothing but the compound which is toxic to the cell. So, toxic to whom? Toxic to amoeba cell and kills the amoeba. Okay. Now, you might have one more question. How exactly it does this function? Well, it has some nitro nitro group. This metronidazole has some nitro group. This nitro group will take up all the electrons which are present inside the amoeba. When this amoeba, when this works as a electron acceptor, the electrons are taken up. So there will be a cytotoxic compounds formed as a result of electron taking up. The reason will be the oxidized or reduced compounds which are toxic to the amoeba will be formed. Okay. Now this is um, metronidazole can also be used in the urinary tract infections urinary tract infections okay this will be the drug of choice now one more question which they can ask you regarding the metronidazole that you need to learn is metronidazole causes something like disulfuram like reaction it will cause disulfuram furam like reaction what is this disulfuram disulfuram is a drug which is used in the treatment of alcoholism. So what happens during use of this disulfuram compound, there is a toxic metabolite which is formed in the body named as acetaldehyde. So like that, when acetaldehyde is formed, that acetaldehyde will make aversion towards the alcohol by causing every time the person drinks alcohol, that person will start to develop vomiting and he'll feel sick. So to then that will cause the aversion towards the alcohol. So that's how this disulfuram works. Like disulfuram, which drug works is metronidazole. Which drug works is metronidazole. Now the question is metronidazole. What is the question? Metronidazole should be avoided with alcohol. So metronidazole avoid with alcohol. Avoid with alcohol. So in fact pretty much simple statement I can give you. The simple statement is that all the antibiotics should be avoided with the alcohol. Now by this thing you need to understand this question that is this metronidazole is a drug which could be used in the urinary tract infection some gram negative anaerobes as well as amoebic infections okay so this is a story for metronidazole okay guys i'm trying to keep it as fast as possible so that we'll cover up all the questions okay i'm covering up all only the important aspect which are asked in these questions okay now the next question let's see a woman works as a railway traffic controller okay she suffers from vasomotor rhinitis and gets treatment in outpatient setting. Okay, she was prescribed an antihistamine. So, this lady was given an antihistamine. Has no effect upon the central nervous system, what drug it is. Now, the question they asked is, she, there is a female, she is having rhinitis. For this female, we gave some antihistamine. We gave some antihistamine. Now, this antihistamine which we gave has no effect on the CNS. 
So we need to find out which antihistamine doesn't have effect on the CNA. Now, by that to understand antihistamines are divided into two types. Antihistamines are divided into two types. First generation, first generation and the second generation, second generation. Now some people would say there is a third generation of antihistamines. Well, pretty much the second generation is considered to be the third generation. So we don't have a specific group written in the textbook which says third generation antihistamines. Okay. Now these first generation antihistamines are having CNS effects. They have CNS effects. What is the CNS effect of the first generation antihistamine? That is sedation. That is sedation. Okay. While a second generation antihistamines, they do not cross blood-brain barrier. They do not cross blood brain barrier. If they do not cross the blood brain barrier, means there is no effect on the central nervous system. Okay. So, if there is no effect on the central nervous system, second generation antihistamines has no effect on the central nervous system, means there is no sedation. No sedation. Now, what is the importance of this no sedation thing? The importance of this no sedation thing is that she works as a railway traffic controller, right? If she is working as a railway traffic controller, she must have full attention towards the job. So if she must have full attention towards the job, what should be required? The required thing is that she must not feel asleep. If she must not feel asleep, if she must not feel asleep, there should not be effect on the central nervous system. So which of those drugs work as a second generation antihistamines? The drugs include, the drugs includes loratadine, loratadine, citrazine, citrazine, Levocitrazine, Levocitrazine, okay, Desloratidine, 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 okay. Now, when I'm talking about this first generation antihistamine, one of the favorite drug is Benadryl we have. Okay, we have one more drug that is Diphenetramine, Diphenetramine, which is also called as Dimetro. Dimetrol. Okay, so these are the two antihistamine drugs which works as a first generation antihistamine. So first generation antihistamine, what is the side effect? The side effect will be sedation. So avoid them in the people who requires more, most of the attention. So that's why we are prescribing the loratadine. So that's why answer would be loratadine. Why not Dimetrol? Dimetrol is a first generation antihistamine which cross the blood brain barrier, which cross the blood brain barrier. If it is crossing the blood brain barrier, it will block the H block the histamine H1 H1 receptor which are present in the central nervous system which will lead to what which will lead to sedation okay now we have two types of histamine receptor if you want to learn full antihistamines there is a other video on the channel you can check out <coughs> histamine receptor would be divided into two types H1 and H2 H1 is present all over the body H2 is present in the GIT that is in the stomach so this is a story of our second generation antihistamine. So how to solve the question? You need to pay attention what they are asking. So in this question, what they asked was, which is the antihistamine which has no central nervous system effect that will be second generation antihistamine. So in the in this case, they can give you in the option, there might be loratadine, you might find citrazine, levocitrazine or desloratadine. Any of the option which you find in the answer, that will be the answer. So there is no rule that there is, there should be always loratadine. So you don't have to mark it up. Alright. So this is a story of our antihistamine loratadine clear so we are done with this second question let's go to the next question so the next question says that during an operation a patient was <coughs> patient got an injection of the myo relaxant that is dithylene that is dithylene right so if we got an injection of dithylenium what will happen let's see okay dithylenium relaxation of the skeletal muscle and inhibition of the resist respiration lasted two hours this condition was caused by the absence of the following enzyme in the plate serum okay now let's learn about the dithylenum dithylenum is what dithylenum is a type of depolarizing myorelaxant what is it depolarizing myorelaxant myorelaxant so what do i mean by depolarizing myorelaxant what it does see guys if i say this is a muscle okay and this is a nerve ending right so if this is a nerve ending here i will have which receptor that will be nm receptor nm receptor which is present in the neuromuscular junction which will be stimulated by the acetylcholine that we all know 
Now, dithylium is a big molecule which is similar to that of acetylcholine, which is similar to that of acetylcholine. Now, dithylium does what? It just, it is a large molecule which will sit in the neuromuscular junction. When it sits in the neuromuscular junction, what happens? It will keep stimulating this NM receptor. It will keep stimulating this NM receptor. Okay. Now, when it keeps stimulating NM receptor, at one point, what will happen? The sensitivity of the NM receptor will be lost. Okay. So, what happens? First thing, it stimulates the receptor. Later, it will lead to desensitization. Desensitization. Right. So, this is, this will lead to, if desensitization means, this receptor won't get stimulated. Won't get stimulated. If won't get stimulated, what will happen? The muscle will remain relaxed muscle will remain relaxed. So, this is the mechanism of action of a depolarizing myorelaxant. Okay. Now, we have phase 1 block, phase 2 block which is not required for this question. Okay. Now, what happens? If I inject, dithylinum is a short acting drug. Dithylinum is a short acting drug. Once it is a short acting drug, so they told, they injected the drug, all the muscles went paralyzed. Even all the muscles went paralyzed. The person remained, the person remained what? Having this muscle relaxant for 2 hours. Now, we need to understand one thing. As usual, ACH we have. ACH is metabolized by an enzyme called ACH, acetylcholine esterase. The same way our dithylinum is metabolized by an enzyme called butyrylcholine esterase. Okay. Now, if I don't have this enzyme butyrylcholine esterase, if I don't have this butyrylcholine esterase, what will happen when I don't have this butyrylcholine esterase? I will dithylinum will remain in the body. Yes or no? If dithylinum remains in the body for a long period of time, what will happen? The myorelaxation property will be prolonged and that's how the patient will undergo what? Patient will undergo the paralysis of the muscle. Now, if I get this condition, how do I treat this person? Now, what happens if I have slight deficiency of this enzyme, the person might end up respiratory paralysis. Now, when the person ends up respiratory paralysis, how do we treat this person? We treat by giving a artificial ventilation artificial ventilation what do i mean by artificial ventilation i would place a tube i would place a intubation tube and connect him the patient to the ventilator and that's how we treat the patient okay so which enzyme deficiency will lead to this condition the condition will be caused by the deficiency of butyryl choline esterase so this is the explanation for our third question clear so let's go to the fourth question so when i'm talking of the fourth question here guys let's look at the question a 45 year old woman suffers from the allergic seasonal coryza caused by ambryosa blooming. what medicine from the stabilizers of the adipose cell group can be used for the prevention of this disease? Well, I agree. Now, the question is that she is having what? She is having a seasonal coryza and allergy. Okay. If the allergy is there, we need to know allergy is mediated by a compound called as histamine. Fourth question. Okay. It is mediated by a compound called histamine. Right. Now, where this histamine comes from? Histamine is coming from the source for the histamine is something called as mast cell. What is it called as? Mast cell. Okay. Now I have a mast cell. Now when this mast cell undergo degranulation, mast cell undergo degranulation means what? It will break down. When this mast cell breaks down, what will happen? The histamine will be released. The histamine will be released. Now the histamine when is when it is released, that will lead to what? Allergy allergy now if i know that i have allergy to some substance what i can do i can prevent the allergic attack right how can i prevent the allergy attack it's very simple to prevent the allergic attack how do we do the allergic attack prevention is just by don't let this mast cell break means do not let this mast cell to degranulate yes or no so how do i not let this mast cell degranulate by giving mast cell stabilizer mast cell stabilizer Okay, so when I use a mast cell stabilizer, what will happen? This mast cell won't degranulate. If it won't degranulate, there is no histamine. If there is no histamine, there is no allergy, right? So all we can do is prevent it from the breaking. So there are two types of two two drugs we have, we need to know of the mast cell stabilizer. I'll write it here: mast cell stabilizer. Adipose cells, adipose cells are nothing but they are referring to the mast cells. Okay? Mast cells uh, uh, stabilizer, one of them is ketotiphen. The second drug is called as chromoglycate sodium. Chromoglycate 
sodium. What is this chymoglycate sodium is also called as, it's also called as chromoly. Chromoly sodium. Okay. So, this is a story of our mast cell stabilizers. Okay. So, this is a story of our mast cell stabilizer. Let's go to the next question. Okay. The next question, systemic amoebiasis. See, we got back the question. We already know the answer. Systemic amoebiasis. Okay. With the involvement of intestine, liver, lung, what diagnosed in a 52-year-old patient? What drug should be prescribed? Let's see. So, the answer would be metronidazole. What are the other options they have given? E, e, among the given other options, none of them are anti-protozoal or anti-amoebic drug. So, the only drug which can be used will be metronidazole. Clear? So, the spelling given here will be wrong. Clear. Okay. Now, let's go. A woman was... A 38-year-old man poisoned himself with a mercury dichloride. When he was poisoned himself with a mercury chloride, so what is what type of poisoning it is? So it is a metal poisoning. Yes or no? If there is a metal poisoning, we need to treat this person. Let's see how. What was taken to admission room give in a grave condition? What antidote should be immediately introduced? Okay, so they are asking what a person injected in... in intake and mercury okay when he take mercury it is a type of metal for metal we use a treatment called as chelating agent chelating agent now chelating agent for each metal might differ each metal might differ but one thing is that universal chelating agent universal chelating agent the drug will be unithiol unithiol so, unithiol is what? Unithiol is an antidote or a universal chelating agent for the metals. Clear? But this rule will always not work. Why it will not always work? Because some metals have their own particular antidotes. For example, calcium, antidote for calcium, the other metal which we use as an antidote, that would be magnesium. Okay? So, calcium antidote will be magnesium. Clear? So, the same way, but if I don't have, for example, any other thing, maybe I can try, but most importantly, calcium antidote will be magnesium. For iron, that is deferoxamine. So that antidote for each of the thing changes. But one important key point here is that universal antidote means which we can use it for any sort of metal poisoning that we can try one drug that will be our unithiol. Clear? So this is a story of our unithiol. Okay. Now the other option, atropine is a cholino blocker. No, none of them belong to the chelating agent so nothing to worry about that okay let's go to the next question a patient who suffer from insomnia okay a person is suffering from insomnia caused by emotional disorder was prescribed a hypnotic drug with a tranquilizing effect <coughs> so what happened there was a they gave a hypnotic drug and a tranquilizing effect what hypnotic was prescribed okay now the question here is that this person is having insomnia agreed Okay, the person has an emotional disorder and they gave him a hypnotic drug with a tranquilizing effect. Tranquilizing effect is nothing but making the person calm. So, that is, will be our anxiolytic effect. Anxiolytic effect. Okay, now which of the following drug was used? Okay, now insomnia, insomnia means we need to induce the sleep. Okay, at the same time, anxiety should be broken. Right. So, this is how we treat. So, which of the given drug has that property of the property for which has which drug which possesses the insomnia treatment, anxiolytic effect and hypnotic effect that will be by a group of drug called as benzodiazepines, BZD, benzodiazepines. Now, what are these benzodiazepines? They are the GABAergic drugs. They are what? GABAergic drugs. What do I mean by GABAergic drugs? GABAergic drugs are the group of drugs which stimulate GABA system, which stimulate the GABA system. So, what happens when they stimulate the GABA system? When the GABA system or GABA neurons are getting stimulated, what will happen? GABA is a gamma amino butyric acid. It's a type of inhibitory neurotransmitter means it will make the brain function or a brain conduction to get slow. When it becomes slow, what will happen? The person will start to feel better by the same of the symptoms of anxiety at the same time insomnia will be getting better because that will induce the sleep okay now what is the thing i told about the benzodiazepines what are the benzodiazepine drugs we have the benzodiazepine drugs which we have is diazepam 
diazepam. Okay, we have nitrozepam, nitrozepam. Okay, we have a drug called as midazolum. Now the thing is, all most of the most of the benzodiazepines they end with zappa. Okay, but except for midazolum. Okay, so our answer will be nitrozepam. Nitrozepam is what? Nitrozepam is a benzodiazepine. Benzodiazepine has which property? The property to induce the sleep that is hypnotic property. That will so we can use it in the treatment of insomnia, anxiolytic, a tranquilizing effect which decreases that which we can use it in the treatment of anxiety. Clear? So this is a story of our nitrozapa. Clear? Now, one more question could be asked from here. What is the antidote for benzodiazepine? Antidote for benzodiazepine is a very important thing which we need to know that is called as flumazenil. What is it? Flumazenil. Flumazenil is what? Flumazenil is an antidote for benzodiazepines. Means if I have a patient who took a lot of quantity of Lots of quantity of nitrozapam or benzodiazepine, any other drug such as diazepam. Now, if I need to treat that person, I will use which drug? The drug which I will be using would be flumazenil. Flumazenil will be an antidote for benzodiazepines. So, we, we already discussed two antidotes here. Three antidotes, in fact. Universal metal antidote, that is unethiol. Calcium antidote, magnesium. Magnesium antidote, calcium. At the same time, the antidote for the benzodiazepines. <clears throat> that will be our flumazenil and what are the properties of benzodiazepines they cause us they induce the sleep they decrease the anxiety they could be used in the treatment of psychosis these drugs could be used in the treatment of epileptic seizures which is ongoing means answer sudden onset the pay if the patient is seizing in front of you you can use these benzodiazepines to treat the patient yeah so this is a story of our <coughs> this is a story of our benzodiazepines Okay, Chalo, let's go to the next question, the question number 8. The question number 8, again, it looks like a similar question which we already discussed. Okay, now, a patient had, had to go through an operation, doctor introduced him a dithalinum. Okay, dithalinum was given and after perform the intubation, after the end of the operation, cessation of anesthesia, independent respiration was not restored. So, he is having what? He is having a esterases deficiency. See, we need to understand, we have acetylcholine, sorry. We have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will be broken by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. Will be broken by enzyme called acetylcholine esterase to acetate plus choline. At the same time, we have another group of enzymes which I would like to simply call it as sister enzymes of acetylcholine esterase that include other esterases, other esterases such as butyryl choline esterase. Butyryl cholinesterase, pseudocholinesterase. Okay, all the esterase enzymes. Okay, if I have deficiency of them, what will happen? Let's see. Now I have dithilinum. We already discussed this question. Dithilinum will be broken down into its metabolites by which enzyme? By the pseudocholinesterase or butyryl cholinesterase. For example, if I don't have this enzyme, if I don't have this enzyme what will happen dithilinum will remain in the body dithilinum is what my relaxant means it will do relaxation of the muscle when muscle go more relaxed what will happen person will experience the paralysis okay so this is the story of our question number eight which already discussed this is a repeat question okay chalo let's go to the next question what it is okay so, the alternate usage of diclothiazide, etacrinic acid, lasix did not cause mass diuretic, marked diuretic effect in a patient with the marked peripheral edema. Increased amount of aldosterone is in the blood. Indicate the medicine to be prescribed. It's a very simple question. What they told? First, the patient had edema. If the patient had edema, what would be the treatment? If a patient has severe edema, the treatment would be diuretic. So, already they used diuretic, they used thiazide, at the same time they used etacrinic and lasix. Now, etacrinic acid and lasix, etacrinic acid and lasix, these are the two drugs which are called as loop diuretics. Loop 
diuretics. Now these loop diuretics are the ones which are the strongest diuretics. Even after using the drugs, the patient's edema didn't get better. Apart from that, they found aldosterone extra in the body. When they found aldosterone extra in the body, now what is the drug to be given? Okay. <clears throat> now let's understand diuretics. Diuretics are the group of drugs which increase the urine output. Which increase the urine output. Now among all the diuretics, we have around five groups. We have five types of diuretic. In that loop diuretics are the strongest ones. Loop diuretics are the strongest ones. When I am talking about loop diuretics are the strongest ones. That is why we use them in the treatment of pulmonary edema, brain edema and the <clears throat> any sort of poisons to flush it out from the body. Even though using that drugs didn't help apart from that, they found aldosterone extra in the body. When aldosterone is there, what aldosterone does? It increases the sodium and water in the body. When it increases the sodium and water in the body, that will easily lead to edema. That will easily lead to edema. Now the question is that how do we treat? If I have more aldosterone, how does aldosterone work? Now guys, aldosterone act in the collecting duct. Act on collecting duct. Of what collecting duct of the nephron? Yes or no? Now when I am talking about a collecting duct of the nephron, let's make a simplified diagram of a collecting duct. So this let's keep this is the distal convoluted tubule and this is the collecting duct of the nephron. Okay. In collecting duct of the nephron, we have some special cells. We have two types of cells. One of them is, so we have alignment of the cells sitting like this. Okay. In this, we have something called principal cells. <coughs> In this, we have two types of cells. Okay. So among the, them will be principal cells. In this principal cell, in this principal cell, we have aldosterone receptor. Aldosterone receptor. When I have aldosterone, aldosterone will go and act on the aldosterone receptor. When aldosterone receptor gets stimulated, that will lead to what? <coughs> Increase of sodium and water in the body. Water in the body. We have another type of cells called as intercalated cell or drug which is related spironolactam which will be working on the principal cells. Okay. Now, aldosterone is going and acting on the aldosterone receptor. Yes or no? So, it's simple as that. If I take one cell, one of the principal cell, I had a aldosterone receptor sitting inside the cell. Now, what happens if I have aldosterone? This aldosterone will go, act on the aldosterone receptor. It will stimulate the nucleus. Nucleus will produce a protein. Protein will come and sit here. This protein will absorb the sodium. At the same time, it will also kick out the potash. Okay. So, this is how our aldosterone works. Now, I can do one simple thing. The simple thing is that block this aldosterone receptor. If I block the aldosterone receptor, even the aldosterone is there, that won't work. Receptor won't work. If receptor won't work, sodium and water will not remain in the body. If sodium and water will not remain in the body, edema will be treated. Now, which of the drugs will block the aldosterone receptor? So, I will call them as what? Aldosterone antagonist. Aldosterone antagonist. Aldosterone antagonist is nothing but a blocker for the aldosterone receptor. So, aldosterone antagonist include, aldosterone antagonist include, we have one drug called as spironolactone, spironolactone and we have one more drug called as epleronone, epleronone, okay. So, these are the two drugs which work as an aldosterone antagonist. Now, what they do, the side effect of aldosterone antagonist will be exactly to the opposite to that of what? Opposite to that of aldosterone means aldosterone increase the sodium and water in the body and decrease the potassium in the body. In the body, yes or no means decrease the potassium in the blood. But aldosterone antagonist will cause a side effect exactly opposite because they are blocking the aldosterone. So when aldosterone is blocked, exactly opposite thing will happen. If aldosterone is working, sodium will be more. If aldosterone is not working, now that will be the side effect of this drug because this is the one who is blocking the aldosterone. So the side effect of this drug would be hyperkalemia. Why hyperkalemia? Because it will not allow the aldosterone to work. If aldosterone was working, aldosterone will kick the potassium into the urine. You will kick the potassium into the urine but that will not happen. That will lead to what? Hyperkalemia. 
hyperkalemia. So that will be the side effect which will be caused by aldosterone antagonist. At the same time, these sub substances will have little structurally similar property or which have affinity toward the testosterone receptor. Even they can lead to sometimes gynecomasty. Gynecomasty. Okay. So these are the two side effects which you need to remember. What is the mechanism of spironolactin? The mechanism of spironolactin is aldosterone receptor blocker. Clear? So this is the story of our aldosterone. Let's go to the next question. The next question will be, okay. A 56 year old patient complains with the thirst, frequent urination with them have diagnosed with the diabetes mellitus and bu butamine was prescribed. What is the mechanism of this drug? Okay. Now, actually speaking, the, there are some conspiracies here. The conspiracy is that some drugs which are written, which were for the crow question, they are translated questions. So little difficulty with finding the drug. But according to this, answer they have given it stimulate the beta cells of islets of langer hands means butamine is a substance we don't have clear mechanism because we i tried to find it even i could not find the what is butamine because it's a defect in the translation of the questions well it stimulate the beta cells of the langer hands means a patient with diabetes mellitus will have decreased insulin will have decreased insulin or or insulin resistance insulin resistance okay when they have this any of these things any of these factors what will happen for insulin resistance we treat by sensitizers we treat by sensitizers okay but if there is a low insulin we need to increase the insulin production we need to increase the insulin production or we can do one more thing patient doesn't have insulin just give him the insulin give insulin yes or no so give insulin will be direct insulin therapy but insulin production could be increased by some group of drugs such as sulfonyl ureas sulfonyl ureas okay now this sulfonyl ureases are the group of drugs they are called as secretogox secretogox Okay, now these secretogogs do what? These secretogogs, secretogogs are the group of drugs which increase the insulin production, which increase the insulin. How they increase the insulin? How they increase the insulin? That's one of the important things. Let's see here. Okay, how they increase the insulin? If I take this as one cell of beta, one beta cell of the Langer hands, okay, in the pancreas, what happens? Now, usually, Glucose will be there, right? Glucose will be taken up by the glucose transporter into the pancreas. Now, this glucose which comes inside the cell, which will undergo glycolysis, which will undergo glycolysis. Glycolysis will lead to ATP formation. ATP formation. When the glycolysis will lead to ATP formation, these cells have special ATP sensitive, ATP sensitive, sensitive potassium channels potassium channels now what happens <coughs> usually if i don't have atp if i don't have atp this potassium channel will remain open when potassium channel remain open potassium will go out this is the normal process which will be happening but when i have atp when i have atp now this atp will go and bind with the atp sensitive potassium channel this potassium channel will get closed now what will happen potassium inside the cell will start to slowly increase when potassium inside the cell will slowly start to increase it is a positive ion when it is a positive ion that will lead to what depolarization when depolarization happens there are some vesicles which are present inside the cell of beta cells of langer hands which store the insulin due to this depolarization which will release the insulin which will release the insulin okay now all these secretogogs go and block this atp sensitive potassium channel means they are working similar to that of atp by blocking these potassium channels when potassium channel blocked potassium inside the cell increase increase lead to depolarization depolarization lead to secretion of the insulin so this is a beautiful process how our 
insulin is produced okay so this is the story of our 10th question now let's go to the next question okay now the next question is not much of written explanation let's see a 37 year old patient suffering from the obliterating vasculite vascular endarteritis of the lower limb takes daily 60 micrograms per kilogram phenylene phenylene because of preser presentation of convulsion disorder craniocerebral trauma in the history anamnesis means history he was prescribed a phenobarbital withholding of this drug can cause the nasal hemorrhage what is the complication connected with okay now what happens guys this person <coughs> okay this person was taking a phenobarbital phenobarbital now phenobarbital okay phenobarbital is a drug which does what it see it is a type of drug which is like induces the microsomal oxidation okay now microsomal oxidation inducers okay so these are called as enzyme inducer these are called as enzyme inducer now this enzyme inducer what will happen enzyme inducer means these are the enzymes which increase the metabolism of the drugs which increase the metabolism of drugs now what happens for example i have drug a okay now i have drug b. now usually i have a patient now this patient was taking the drug a this is a story now what happens this drug b is a enzyme inducer now i will add both a and b if i add both a and b now b will do what b will induce the enzyme yes or no when b induces the enzyme the A will also get metabolized means all the drugs will start to get metabolized because of one of them is an enzyme inducer. Another drug will also get metabolized faster. Now what I will do to overcome this, I will increase the, I will increase the dose. Once I increase the dose, okay, and all of a sudden I will stop giving this drug. Now there is no induction. This drug will show the side effect because this drug will become more dose because metabolism will become slow. Yes or no? Now what they told, he is having some vasculitis. He was taking some drug, okay? But when he was taking the drug, he was taking with the phenobarbital. Phenobarbital is a type of enzyme inducer, okay? Now in this case scenario, the drug which is given here would be drug A and drug which is given phenobarbital would be drug B. Now what will happen till drug B was used, the patient has to take more of this phenylalanine drug. But what happened? I stopped phenobarbital. What will happen? This drug will become more dose because now there is no inducer. If there is no inducer, the patient will have what? Patient will have side effect caused by this drug. This is the story of the in induction of the microsomal enzymes in the liver. Clear? So most of the drugs which will undergo metabolism by the microsomal oxidation that's why when you are combining any drug with the inducer drugs so you have to be careful with this okay so this is a story of a inducer so usually inducer we have microsomal inducers we have phenytoin okay we have griseofulvin griseofulvin okay now we have smoking which induces the enzyme Okay, now all of these drugs, phenytoin, phenobarbital, griseofulvin, okay, smoking, all of these things induce the microsomal enzymes. Clear? So this is a story of our microsomal induction. Okay, now a patient complain. Next question, twelfth question. Let's go for the. A patient complains of the dryness in the mouth, photophobia, and the vision violation was admitted to the reception room. Skin is hyperemic, dry, pupil are dilated tachycardia poison with belladonna alkaloids was diagnosed okay now we need to understand something guys belladonna alkaloids belladonna alkaloids now these belladonna alkaloids are the group of substances which have atropine like compound what is it atropine like compound atropine like compound when this atropine like compound is there that will do what cholino blocking atropine is a cholino blocker okay 
when it is a cholino blocker means what it is a parasympathetic blocker parasympathetic blocker yes or no so parasympathetic is blocked when parasympathetic is blocked that will lead to increased activity of sympathetic system when increased activity of sympathetic system what happens definitely dryness in the mouth will come photophobia will come vision violation will come these two is due to what pupil dilation okay then the skin will be hyperemic yes of course tachycardia would be there all of these are the sympathetic symptoms but that happened due to cholino blocker that is due to belladonna alkaloids which has atropine like compound which leading to cholino blocker activity now usually what is the antidote for atropine antidote for atropine atropine antidote is physostigmine is physostigmine okay that will so if they ask you the question what is the antidote for atropine the answer should be physostigmine but if your option doesn't contain physostigmine okay then you can go for neostigmine neostigmine usually the answer or the in reality what we need to use is physostigmine but proserin is a other name for neostigmine proserin is what proserin other name for your neostigmine okay now this proserin is one of the things which are mentioned in the ukrainian questions which you need to pay attention towards okay because the questions will be translated sometimes that's why okay from ukrainian a patient complains of weakness dyspnea lower extremity edema diagnosis was chronic cardiac insufficiency what medication should be given okay now if a patient is having chronic heart failure or a congestive heart failure we need to give the patient which could be of two which could be called as cardiac glycosides cardiac glycosides now in a patient who is having chronic heart heart failure the cardiac glycoside the drug of choice will be digoxin the drug of choice will be digoxin okay now they have mentioned it as digitoxin but the usually that would be digoxin okay now this is a story of our cardiac glycoside okay. now how this cardiac glycoside works there is a big lecture on the youtube channel that is heart failure you can find it out there okay because i have discussed about the toxicity of this one also that's all. okay now now let's go to the next question 14th okay signs of gastropathy developed in a patient with the rheumatoid arthritis who was treated with the indomethacin with what activity of this drug complication is connected okay what they have given the patient was given a indomethacin indomethacin what is this indomethacin what is this indomethacin indomethacin is a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug nsa okay now this nsa what is the mechanism of action of this one they are cox inhibitor they are cox inhibitor okay now we need to understand this cox is a enzyme which has two types cox 1 in fact now we have three isotypes okay cox 2 and even we have cox 3 but usually we are discussing about cox 1 and 2 okay cox 1 is present in a physiological condition in a normal person cox 2 is present during the inflammation okay so <clears throat> the thing here we need to pay attention is cox 1 is a one which is present physiologically physiologically it is protecting the stomach it is protecting the stomach how it is protecting the stomach it is protecting the stomach by the help of prostaglandin by the help of by the help of something called prosta glandins okay now it produces some prostaglandins which maintain the circulation of the stomach and that's how it is being protected okay now what is the relation between the indomethacin indomethacin and the protection of the stomach let's discuss okay guys nsaids are the group of drugs which are cox inhibitors so they are blocking which enzyme cox enzyme if they are blocking the cox enzyme what will happen cox 2 is present during the inflammation 
COX2 is present during the inflammation, what we need to block will be COX2. Okay, but indomethacin is a non selective COX inhibitor. Is a non selective COX inhibitor. So, if it is a non selective COX inhibitor, means what? It will block both COX1 and the COX2. COX2 blockage will lead to treat the inflammation, but COX1 blockage will lead to what? No prostaglandin. If there is no prostaglandin, no protection to the stomach. Means if there is no COX1, no physiological protection. If there is no physiological protection, means that the patient will end up having ulcer. ulcer. So by this logic, what we need to understand, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, can cause the side effect as a peptic ulcer. At the same time, they are contraindicated in a patient who is having peptic ulcer or any sort of gastric pathologies try to avoid non-selective COX inhibitor means which blocks both COX1 and COX2. For example, if I have a patient, if I have a patient who is having for example peptic ulcer but still I had to give him what? COX inhibitor. I had to give him COX inhibitor. That time I will go what? Selective COX inhibitor means I will do some, I will give some drug which blocks only COX2 so that it won't damage the stomach, okay? So, that will be selective COX2 inhibitor. Selective COX2 inhibitor. So, the selective COX2 inhibitor, the drugs include rafecoxib, rafecoxib, itrocoxib, selecoxib, okay? So, these are the drugs which can be used as a selective COX2 inhibitor. If I have a patient who is having, for example, if I had a question patient as a peptic ulcer and also rheumatoid arthritis, which of the following NSAID should be given? That time you need to go for what? Selective COX inhibitor. And how to remember? COXIB is the term. And look at this. COX inhibitor IB. Clear? So, this is the story of our NSAIDs. So, indomethacin is what? Non-selective. Let me give you some other drugs along with the indomethacin which work as a non-selective COX inhibitor. I am writing on the top here. That includes ibuprofen. Ibuprofen. That includes our aspirin. The other name for aspirin that will be acetyl salicylic salicylic acid. Acetyl salicylic acid okay so this is a story of our anti cox so that okay what activity is connected so that will be anti cyclo oxygenase means cox blockage activity so this is a story of our cox inhibitors okay now let's talk testosterone and its analogs increase the mass of the skeletal muscle that allow to use them for the treatment of dystopy due to interaction of the hormone with what cell substance is this action? Guys, we need to directly remember the testosterone receptor. Testosterone receptor are a type of nuclear receptor. What do I mean by this? If I take this as a cell, I can have receptor, for example, on top of the nucleus, on top of the, in the cytoplasm or on the membrane. Okay. For example, when I was discussing earlier aldosterone, aldosterone was a type of cytoplasmic receptor. Testosterone is a type of nuclear receptor. Now, most of the times, this nuclear receptor and cytoplasmic receptor considered to be the same because few, few substances receptor which work as both cytoplasmic which are on the nucleus also. So, nuclear and cytoplasmic and the membrane receptor. Membrane receptor which are present on the cell membrane. This is the cytoplasmic and this is our uh, nuclear receptor. Usually, the way I remembered it is most of the steroidal hormones, most of most of them, most of the steroidal hormones has cytoplasmic or nuclear receptor. So, how to this is how I remember this. If that's useful, you can remember. Okay, Chal. now let's go to the next question. That was question number 16. Okay, <laughs> a patient ill with neurodermatitis has been taking prednisolone for a long time now he is taking what he is having some sort of dermatitis he is taking prednisolone okay okay for a long time the examination revealed high rate of sugar in the blood 
this complication caused by the drug influence upon the link of the carbohydrate metabolism. Okay, chal, let's discuss here. Now, what is prednisolone? First, prednisolone is a glucocorticoid. Prednisolone is what? It is a glucocorticoid. Glucocorticoid are also called as corticosteroid. Corticosteroid. Okay. So, since it is a glucocorticoid or corticosteroid, it has some properties. It works as an anti-inflammatory drug. It works as an anti-inflammatory -infl drug. Okay. It works as anti-inflammatory. How it works as anti-inflammatory? By inhibiting an enzyme called as phospholipase phospholipase a2 blockage okay now this is a short review okay if you need to learn more there is one more video of corticosteroids also on the channel you can go find it out okay now apart from that this glucocorticoids apart from this glucocorticoids that will increase the blood glucose that will increase the blood glucose how they increase the blood glucose that is an important point which you need to remember that is by increasing gluconeogenesis. What do I mean by gluconeogenesis? The gluconeogenesis is nothing but, gluconeogenesis is nothing but what? It is nothing but formation of glucose, formation of glucose, okay, from non-carbohydrate source non-carbohydrate source so what do i mean by formation of glucose from the non-carbohydrate source that means it is forming glucose for example from amino acid for example from fatty acid which are not carbohydrate these are forming the glucose so this is a process where we call it as gluconeogenesis all right okay so if i'm telling this that will increase the blood sugar by gluconeogenesis now how they are they asked what the patient was taking prednisolone. Prednisolone is what? It's a type of corticosteroid. If it is a type of corticosteroid, what it will do? It will increase the blood glucose. How will it increase the blood glucose? By doing what? By gluconeogenesis. So, apart from this, few more short, short points. Let's remember and revise about glucocorticoids once and for all. That is, it will also increase the blood pressure by increasing of sodium and water retention sodium and water retention they also do one more thing what is the one more thing what they do they are immunosuppressive they are immunosuppressive so they suppress our immune system so if they are suppressing our immune system there can be one use there can be one side effect what is the use we can use it in the transplantation because to avoid the transplantation reaction yes or no but what is the side effect that will be secondary infection secondary infection due to weak immune system yes or no so this will be the side effect and this will be the use if i have a patient who is having sudden decrease of blood pressure as well as the patient if the patient has what sudden decrease of the blood glucose and the blood pressure directly i can push him a corticosteroid that would be useful okay now apart from prednisolone we have other corticosteroids that include methylprednisolone okay so <coughs> Methylprednisolone, we have budanosid, we have uh, dexamethasone, we have butam betamethasone, we have cortisol. Okay, all of these drugs work similar to that of prednisolone, all of them are corticosteroids. Okay, now corticosteroids are also produced in our body from the adrenal cortex. From the adrenal cortex, that you should remember. So, if I have more corticosteroid, increased level of corticosteroids will lead to what? That will lead to a disease called as Cushing syndrome or a Cushing's disease that depends on the where the source is sitting. Okay. So this is a story of our prednisolone. Okay. Now, if the patient was taking prednisolone, if the patient is taking prednisolone, that is what that will lead to gluconeogenesis activation. If that is leading to gluconeogenesis activation, what is that? That will lead to high level of blood sugar by doing what? By elevating the blood, uh, by increasing the gluconeogenesis. So this is a story of our uh, glue, uh, prigny, solon. Okay, Chalo. now let's go to the next question. Okay, so a patient with the frequent attacks of stenocardia was prescribed a Sustac Forte to be taken one tablet twice a day. At first, the effect was positive, but no, 
but on the second day stenocardia attacks were resumed what can explain the in inefficiency inefficiency of the drug okay now it's called as tachyphylaxis tachyphylaxis is nothing but so the patient was taking some drug okay now when the patient was taking some drug we need to do not confuse between the tachyphylaxis and tolerance okay now i will explain the simplified meaning of these two things okay simplified meaning is that tolerance means for example i had a person i had a person he is an alcoholic he is a alcoholic now this alcoholic person was drinking for example 1 liter of some alcohol every single day but what happens after 5 days he will need 2 liters of alcohol for same effect for same effect okay means till 5 days 1 liter was giving one some effect but from the 6th day he needs 2 liters to get the same effect this is called as tolerance okay now tachyphylaxis is nothing but i have a alcoholic person okay he took 1 liter of alcohol for 5 days at 6th day he takes alcohol it doesn't work it doesn't work does not work what do i mean by does not work means this will not show the effect even by increasing the dose means even if i give 2 liters for example the person had 1 liter he thought uh, it's not working so if it is not working what he will do he will take 2 liters even if he takes 2 liter it will not work he'll take 3 liter it will not work means by increasing the dose effect is not shown that is called as tachyphylaxis by increase the dose is required to be increased to get the same effect that will be tolerance so this is a story of the uh tolerance and tachyphylaxis now let's apply this story to the question so he had some sustec food sustec food supposed to be a brand for the nitroglycerin which is the tablet which is used for the treatment of angina right when i use sustec food that is our angina treatment i gave some drug that showed the relief for first two days and third day the patient did get the relief when he didn't get the relief we need to understand he is having a tachyphylaxis what do i mean by he is having tachyphylaxis it's very simple guys means first two days it worked from third day it didn't work even though he increased the dose so that is explained by one thing that is our tachyphylaxis okay now i will explain about the idiosyncrasy and the material accumulation in some time okay well there is a mistake there is supposed to be a big print mistake they are they are supposed to ask it as a n cholinomimetic that is n cholinomimetic so n cholinomimetic directly we need to remember only one of the important drugs which we have in n cholinomimetics list is lobelin hydrochloride which helps in the uh, carbon monoxide of poisoning to improve the breathing by contracting the muscle how it contracts the muscle is very simple we have a muscle we have a nerve ending and we have a nicotinic receptor yes or no now n cholinomimetic mimetic means what it will stimulate a receptor it will stimulate n cholino receptor muscles will contract the respiratory muscle contracts helps in breathing this is a story of lobelin hydrochloride lobelin hydrochloride is what it's a type of n cholinomimetic it's not a h cholinomimetic clear this is a story of a n cholinomimetic let's go for the next drug. okay now a patient okay an aged patient complains of headache dizziness quick tiredness worsening of memory okay anamnesis in anamnesis the patient had cerebro cranio cerebral injury what medication group should be prescribed so we need to increase the brain metabolism for this person we need to increase the brain metabolism for this person to help him to overcome the headache tiredness and worsening of the memory worsening of the memory so to overcome worsening of the memory we can increase the brain metabolism by some drug called as nootropic nootropics are the group of drugs which increase the brain metabolism clear so this is a story of our nootropic shall let's go to the next question a patient was treated medically for psychosis for 2 weeks the patient condition improved but rigidity tremor hypokinesia developed which of the drug can cause such complications very good so the patient had what psychosis now what i will give antipsychotics antipsychotics okay now antipsychotics will have some mechanism of action what is the mechanism of action of all antipsychotics they are the 
dopamine blockers dopamine receptor blockers receptor blockers where in the central nervous system in the central nervous system so if they are blocking the dopamine receptors in the central nervous system which type of dopamine receptors are present in the central nervous system that will be our d2 receptor okay now these antipsychotics when they block this dopamine receptor they will treat psychosis they will treat psychosis agree okay but at the same same time due to blocking of the dopamine receptor they can lead to something called parkinson like symptoms parkinson like symptoms sun like symptoms parkinson like symptoms means the patient will have what hypokinesia tremors rigidity why parkinson disease is also a disease which is happening due to deficiency of dopamine at the same time at the same time let's compare this thing to the antipsychotic antipsychotic will also create some condition like dopamine deficiency why because it is blocking the dopamine receptor now the person will develop parkinson like symptoms these are also called as extra pyramidal symptoms eps extra pyramidal symptoms so the extra pyramidal symptoms include tremors hypokinesia and rigidity now which of the following drugs will cause so he had psychosis and the extra pyramidal symptoms are developed so we need to find a antipsychotic drug aminazin is a t is a type of antipsychotic drug which causes this side effects so among the given options only only important drug which causes this extra pyramidal symptoms so strongly is aminacin okay so this is the story of our aminacin okay let's go now gonorrhea was revealed in a patient on bacteroscopy smear of the urethra taking into account that medicines for gonorrhea are fluoroquinolones what patient should be prescribed well this question might confuse you because usually for the gonorrhea it is a gonococci in gonococci for all the coca infection we prefer penicillins okay now as they have given like a uh, like a sort of stimulative stimulated or stipulated question that they are telling you need to consider you need to consider that for the gonorrhea treatment is fluoroquinolone if you consider if it has a fluoroquinolone as a treatment the patient what should be prescribed okay usually for gonorrhea treatment is what gonorrhea treatment will be or penicillin only but the, since they have given this statement in the question saying that you medicines for gonorrhea are fluoroquinolone so you need to mark a fluoroquinolone so among the given options which of the following is a fluoroquinolone that will be our ciprofloxacin right so let's discuss little bit about the fluoroquinolones now these fluoroquinolones are a group of drugs they are antibiotics antibiotics now how do they work how do they work antibiotics work these fluoroquinolone antibiotic work by inhibiting one enzyme by inhibiting which enzyme is that that's important question that will be our dna gyrase dna gyrase now when i inhibit this dna gyrase that is a time when this thing by inhibiting the dna gyrase there will be what there will be bacterial growth will be stopped okay so that's how it's working as a antibiotic right okay so this is a story of our fluoroquinolones mechanism now which are the drugs which are present in that fluoroquinolones include ciprofloxacin ciprofloxacin we have moxifloxacin everything ends with floxacin okay moxifloxacin we have levofloxacin we have got we have gatifloxacin gatifloxacin okay now among all these things levofloxacin is considered to be a respiratory fluoroquinolone is considered to be a respiratory fluoroquinolone what do i mean by respiratory fluoroquinolone it means this levofloxacin among all fluoroquinolones is best used for the respiratory infection while as ciprofloxacin could be used for the conditions like uti we can use it in the treatment of cholera okay so this is the story of our fluoroquinolones okay now one important thing fluoroquinolones are contraindicated in children this is a most possible 
question okay fluoroquinolone is contraindicated in children because it causes some serious condition that is called as tendonitis tendonitis so because it causes tendonitis it should be avoided in the children okay so this is a story for fluoroquinolones so among all the given options the fluoroquinolone will be ciprofloxacin okay now let's go now a patient with bronchial asthma was taking a tablet which caused insomnia headache increased blood pressure what medicine can cause the complications okay let's see now a patient with bronchial asthma was taking tablets now adrenaline we don't have in the form of tablets okay now chromoline sodium is mast cell stabilizer we already discussed now we have what euphilin esadrin and epid okay now which caused insomnia means it is a type of central nervous system symptom there is a headache and increased blood pressure they all are what sympathetic activation symptom they all are what what they are sympathetic activation symptoms so if their sympathetic activation system means which of the following is a type of centrally acting sympathomimetic centrally acting sympathomimetic will be ephedrine ephedrine is a type of indirectly acting indirectly acting indirectly acting sympathomimetic sympathomimetic okay now the sympathomimetic will activate the sympathetic activity causing headache increased blood pressure and insomnia okay so this is a story of our in epidrin okay ah chalo let's go to the next question a diuretic drug was prescribed to a patient with hypertension in course of complex treatment in few days bp increased but signs of hypokalemia developed what drug caused this side effect okay now in this condition we are here we will finish about the loop diuretics also already i spoke about the potassium sparing diuretic that was our aldosterone antagonist okay now guys usually if i take this is a nephron okay in the nephron we have proximal convoluted tubule we have thick descending thin descending thin ascending and thick ascending limb of loop of henle okay now we need to pay one important attention is that there is a reabsorption of sodium chloride and potassium sodium chloride and potassium okay in where in the thick ascending limb of loop of henle means that is this part this part has what sodium potassium and chloride reabsorption which is about around 25% reabsorption happens here if 25% reabsorption happens here if i block this reabsorption let's see what will happen i block this reabsorption sodium remains in the kidney in the nephron only it will flow into urine when it is going in the urine sodium will take water with it so one golden rule of the kidney is what the golden rule of the kidney is that sodium wherever it goes it will take water with it means water follows sodium when water follows sodium sodium is going so along with sodium it will be what you uh, water will go that will cause the diuretic effect agreed but if sodium will not absorb here The, it won't allow potassium and chloride also to absorb now what will happen along with sodium and other uh, sodium there will be potassium and chloride will also go yes or no if chloride and potassium will also go end up in the urine what will happen the patient will develop what hypokalemia when patient develops hypokalemia hypokalemia will manifest as a muscle weakness or sometimes even arrhythmia now what they are asking is what is the name of this diuretic which block the reabsorption in the loop of henle they are directly named as loop diuretics loop diuretics okay now the loop diuretic drugs include furosemide furosemide what is the other name for furosemide it is also called as lasix it is also called as lasix now along with furosemide we have one more drug called as ethacrinic acid ethacrinic acid apart from the ethacrinic acid we have even one more drug that is called as bumetanide bumetanide what is the side effect of all of them 
sodium is going hyponatremia potassium is going hypokalemia chloride is going hypochloremia along with that lasix can even cause one more side effect that will be ototoxicity ototoxicity so this is a story of our <coughs> diuretics okay okay let's go to the next question Ascar ascarid eggs have been detected during the stool analysis what should be prescribed which is a direct question which we should know that is ascaris is a helminth ascaris is a helminth mebendazole and albendazole there are two drugs which we need to remember mebendazole and albendazole these are the drug of choice these are the drugs first line drugs which are used in the treatment of helminthic infection they are called as anti helminthic drugs okay a patient suffering from myasthenia gravis has been administered prozerin prozerin is a type of prozerin is also called as neostigma okay he was given a neostigma after the administration the patient has got nausea or diarrhea or twitching of tongue and skeletal muscle what drug should be used to help the uh, help eliminate the toxication they asked okay now what is neostigmine we need to know it's a type of anticholinesterase what is this anticholinesterase guys we need to know one simple thing from the cholinomimetics chapter what is that that will be we have a cholinergic neuron acetylcholine will be released now this acetylcholine will be metabolized by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase yes or no now usually when acetylcholine comes here it will stimulate the cholinoreceptor when it stimulate stimulate cholinoreceptor cholinoreceptor will increase the parasympathetic activity cholinoreceptor will increase the parasympathetic activity now when i have this anticholinesterase drug this will go and block this enzyme if i don't have this acetylcholine esterase what will happen acetylcholine quantity will be increased if i have more acetylcholine quantity more activation of parasympathetic system so that might lead to this is one of one of the effect that at the same time acetylcholine will also stimulate nm receptor if nm receptor stimulates there will be twitching what do i mean by twitching because muscles will start to contract because nm receptors are also stimulated by whom nm receptors can also be stimulated by acetylcholine so that will be the side effect with this drug okay now what is our question what is the antidote for this drug what is the antidote for this drug now anywhere when we have a poisoning with anticholinesterase drug anticholinesterase drug that is not just neostigmine even our physostigmine physostigmine the drug of choice for the treatment would be atropine the antidote would be atropine antidote would be atropine so this is a story of our this is a story of our atropine sulfate what is atropine atropine is what atropine is a type of cholino blocker okay so he this video will stop here and i'll upload a part 2 for this thank you guys